One more time, Journey Church. Come on, let's shout amen like we mean it today. Let's clap together all over our houses in Montgomeryville online. Man, we're starting a new sermon series today called Wild Thing. And uh, based off, off the, the story of John the Baptist in the, in the New Testament, I was reading during Easter, reading the story of Christ, reading uh, the Gospels, and I, I just read through, the, and it just, I was like, this, dude, this dude's wild. I just heard the song Wild Thing in, in my head. And then I started going through my memory and just thinking about different guys in Scripture there, there, was some, there was some dudes in scripture that definitely had mullets. You know what I'm saying? There, there, there was some Chevy drive and lifted guys. And, and like there, there, there was some, like if you read through scripture, oftentimes when we, when we look at like church things and you see like you, you go to church, you're like there's flowers and there's, you know, there's guys wearing dresses and there's all these things going, you know what I'm talking about? And you're like, it just feels like, a, like, like, it, like I'm not supposed to be there. That's how I felt a lot of times about church. I'm like, I don't... I don't like this music is weird. And, but like, then you go to the Bible and you're like, no, like these, 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 these guys were different. And so what I want to do is I want to take you through th- some of these stories of these, these men in scripture that were just a little bit wild. They were, they were just, a, and, and, and listen, I'm, I'm, I'm I wouldn't sit up here and say I'm, I'm, a, I'm a wild guy. Like, I, I, I'm more, more laid back. Like, some of you are much more wild than me. In fact, uh, some, I'm not really a camper. I don't like the, the great outdoors. I don't like the wild. This is as close as I like to be to trees, right? <laughs> Years ago, we were in my townhouse. We had about a 15-foot yard, and then behind us was the Schuylkill River, and, and my boys were younger, and I was like, I'm going to make a memory with them. I want to be the type of dad that when they get older, they talk about all the great things that we used to do together. You know what I'm talking about? I want to be that type of dad. So I'm like, I want, to, I want to all these. I got a, I got a, I got a tent, right? Because they had an Audi's, they had and Audi's, they had one of those. They, they the hour they, they sell stuff that that's, doesn't look like it's supposed to be there. So they had a tent. So I bought a tent. And I was like, we're going to set it up in the backyard, and I'm going to get my fire pit from upstairs, and we're going to build a fire down, down in, this, in this little yard, and, and we're going we're gonna to camp out, and they're going to talk about this when they get older someday. Remember the day that dad, dad camped out with us, and so we set this whole thing up. We got our sleeping bags, and, 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 and we were close enough to the, to the house that we could watch a movie, right, because we don't want to get that wild, right? So we put a movie on our iPad, and we watched a movie, and we were out there in our sleeping bags, and I'm like, we're going to wake up, and we're going to be, you know how it is when you camp. We're going to be all dew-filled, and you're going to take in the morning. It's going to be a Get up, maybe we'll, we'll cook eggs over the fire. I got this big dream. I'm going to be wild tonight, right? And uh, about two hours into it, movie, movie, movie was over. We, we began to hear noises outside and, 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 the, and, the, and the trees behind us rustling and stuff like that. And my boys looked at me and I looked at them and they were like, you want to go inside? I was like, yes, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> so we packed, went inside, packed that tent up, never used it, never used it again. And so like, I, 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 I'm not that wild, right? And, and what I have found in my life is... I want, I want my faith to be, like, I want to have a wild faith, but I want to be close enough to comfort to get out of it if I need, need to, right? Like, because I, I, I'm just of the belief that your faith in God should be a little wild. I, I, think, I think you should do some things that other people think is a little crazy. I think people outside of, of the church, of, the, of what, we, what we are in right now, people that don't believe in God, that if they're not looking at you from time to time going, you're, you're a little weird. Your life is a little different. It doesn't really make sense. You handle your money that way. You give up your time. If they're not thinking at some point you're a little weird, then you're probably, you're probably not really following Christ the way you should. You want to be wild, but you want to be close enough to comfort. So what I want to do is I want to, I want to challenge you. I want God to do some things in your life. I want you to push towards these wild experiences, these overtop moments in your life. Be, being all out for God is my goal my goal for you, in fact, uh, one of my favorite quotes my dad used to say during his sermon is he used to say, attempt something so impossible that unless God steps in, it's going to fail. Step out in your life and attempt something so impossible with your life that unless God intervenes, it's going to fail. So I want to introduce you to the first guy. His name's Elijah. Uh, uh, Elijah. Elijah is probably the most famous prophet in, in the Old Testament. So if you're not a Bible person or a church person, God would raise up prophets in, in, in the Old Testament to go speak on his behalf to the people. He, he would got, listen to God and then speak. That's what prophets or prophetesses would do. They would, they would, that was their one job, right? And so Elijah is probably the most famous prophet. In fact, his story is in 1 Kings chapter 16 or 17 and 9 through 19 and 2 Kings 1 through 2. I don't have time to cover it all, but maybe he might be most famous for not dying. Like when, when God was done with him, he sent a chariot of fire to get him taken back to heaven. Like, 
I've been praying for that. That's the exit I want. I want a, I want a 2000 and let's see how many 40 years from now, 2048 or 68 or whatever. Maybe I don't know how long I'm going to live. I want that version of the Tesla from heaven to come get me when I'm done. And to, I want that to be my story. Like, I can't wait to get to heaven and be like, yo, Elijah, yo, how was that, dude? You were here and then you were gone, right? And so he, he had a lot of, inst- like, he's he done a lot of things like that. But, but the thing is about Elijah is you're introduced to, in, in, introduced to him really quickly in Scripture. It's not, there's not a warm-up to Elijah. He just shows up on the scene. And let me just explain to you the scene that he comes in. So the Jewish people, if you know the Bible, for 400 years, they were slaves in Egypt. Then God rescues them and takes them to what he calls the promised land, where they get things they shouldn't get. They have land they shouldn't have. They win wars they probably shouldn't win. Like, God was with them. But the problem is, is success breeded apathy. You can read it in scripture. Success would breed apathy. And we, we know this. How many of you are fatter than when you got married? Why are you fatter? Your skeleton hasn't changed, right? It's not your de- metabolism. You're, ap- you, you're married. You're like, it's fine, right? Let's eat. Let's be happy. Before you get married, you're, you're, you're getting in shape. You're like, we got to be na- naked, right? Like, and so, <laughs> right? And so that, that's how it goes, right? And then some of us kick it back into gear and, you know, usually at 40, you're like, I should probably do something about it. And so, but like apathy, apathy breeds this. So apathy would breed this in these people where they would begin to wander away from God. So here's what happened. In this time in history, they had 19 evil kings in a row in the Jewish, for the Jewish people. 200 years, the Bible says, of straight evil after evil after evil. And the couple that was currently leading the nation of Israel is maybe the most evil kings in the history of the world. The guy's name is Ahab. The woman's name was Jezebel. You ever hear that name? Jezebel, most historians, biblical, biblical historians will say she was the most evil evil woman in the history of the world 200 years and they were the worst they were the, they did the most evil in the sight of god it's to this that god calls elijah a little side note for you oftentimes when there's a big problem god will find one person to send to fix it might be you might, might be you there's a big problem of purity in high schools he might be calling you as a young girl to stand for purity amongst the sea of craziness there's a lack of integrity in almost every business in america at this at this point a lack of integrity he might be calling you to be in that business to to have integrity what i found oftentimes christians we always want god to get us in the bubble god put me in the bubble god get my kids in the bubble and god wants to send you out into the world he didn't save you to put you in an aquarium so to speak so he sends elijah one man to confront these people and here's how he shows up on the scene Think about the music. Think about the scene in the movie, if you like movies. Think about how this feels. But here's how he is introduced. First Kings chapter 17 says in verse number one, Now Elijah, the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead, comes in and says to Ahab, This is where we meet Elijah. No background. Here's where he's from. Whatever. He shows up to Ahab, the most evil king that they've ever had. And he says, As the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Those are fighting words, right? You, this, this is, this is T.O., Terrell Owens, so you're old enough to remember him, scoring a touchdown for the 49ers and standing on the star in the middle of the Dallas Cowboys Stadium. You guys remember that? He did it one too many times, but the first time he did it, I was like, you're supposed to be an eagle. You are literally, like, <laughs> the, that was fighting words. He walked up and he says, listen, for the next years, until I say, no more rain, which some of you are like, what's the big deal? Well, there wasn't an Aldi's or a Walmart at that point. So if you don't have rain, you don't have crops, you don't have, you don't have an economy, you go into a recession. I forgot to tell you at that time that they had been, become fixated not on the God that could bring the rain, but on false gods. Ahab and Jezebel had pushed the, the worship of false gods, two gods really, Baal and Asherah. So you have these people that were rescued from the promised land, right? And their history is of this God who would redeem them. But they've lost focus of that God. And now they're focused on these two gods. Somebody say, what's the big deal? Well, the worship of Baal to get the rain and all that, it entailed them sacrificing their kids at an altar, killing them. Which some of you would say, why would anybody ever do that? We do that all the time in America. You could call it abortion. You could call it travel sports. 
See, you could talk about abortion in church. It's like, right on. Where were you last Sunday? Travel soccer. <laughs> we sacrifice our kids all the time to our God of success, our God of individuality, our God of comfort, our God of me. So they're worshiping and they're sacrificing their kids. And oh, by the way, Asherah, they would worship her through having sex with prostitutes in the temple. They did more disgusting things at that time that I could even speak about with my words in church. And so Elijah shows up and says, that's it. No more rain. The very next verse says that God takes him away, puts him in a valley, hides him off for three years. Why? Because God's got to get him prepared because he's about to go into a fight. He just poked the bear, so to speak. For three years, he becomes the most hated man in Israel. Isn't that interesting? Oftentimes, we think when God wants to do something significant with us, that we'll be praised by people. And oftentimes, it's the exact opposite. That many of the people that God uses in the Bible were hated by other people. Jeremiah, Isaiah, Elijah, Jesus. He hides them away and prepares them for, for a battle. And in 1 Kings chapter 18, he shows back up. Three years have passed. Everybody hates him, not just Ahab and Jezebel, but even the Jewish people hate Elijah. He shows back up. He talks to a man named Obadiah, who was also a prophet for God, and says, I'm back. Go get Ahab. He tells Elijah, hey, if I go get Ahab and you do that disappearing thing you've been doing for three years, he's going to kill me. So you better stay put, right? I know how you and God are. <laughs> So he goes to get Ahab, and Ahab shows up. And this is how, what he, how what he says. There's that troublemaker. There's that. Tr it's not us. It's not. We're not the reason there's no rain. We're sacrificing our babies and having sex with prostitutes in temple. It's not our fault. It's your fault because you said there would be no, no rain. And then Elijah, he just begins to lay into them. And I, that's where I want to land. Uh, first, first Kings chapter 18, verse number 21 says this. Then Elijah stands in front of them. And he says to them, how much longer are you guys going to waver? How, how much longer are you going to waver back and forth between two opinions? What's the number one problem? They got one foot in the camp of God and they got another, another foot in the camp of, of the worship of false gods. How much longer are you going to waver, he says. If the Lord is your God, what does he say? Follow him. If Baal's going to be your God... Then follow him. The Bible says, but the people were completely silent. I've been there before when you're preaching, it gets super awkward, quiet. Why are you so mad, bro? <laughs> You've been gone for three years. And that's how you come? That's how you want to introduce yourself back into the people? You've been the most hunted man. They had Israel's most wanted to do with the gray hair, come straight back, looking for you on national television. <laughs> And you show up and you made everybody mad and you come with that? What's happening in this moment? Well, what's happening is, is the people are miserable in the middle. They're killing their own babies. They're, they have no peace. They don't have rain. They don't have crops. Their worship of false gods is leading them to destruction. And Elisha loves them enough to tell them the truth. See, some of you have wondered, why is my life so bad, and why is it so broken, and why is it so stress-filled? Because you're in the middle. Why can't I sleep at night? Why do I have to take pills to sleep at night? Because you're in the middle. Why do you have anxiety all the time? You might be in the middle. Why am I always stressed out? You're in the middle. Why does my money never feel like it's enough? You're probably in the middle. Why did the people get quiet? Well, because at that time, the middle was normal. Apathy was normal. Being average was normal. Why does the church get so quiet when you say stuff like, why? well, you can't serve both God and travel soccer. You can't serve both God and money. You can't serve both God and earthly success. You've got to figure out which one you want to success because this is the way we're allowed to live most of the time. I mean, normal is broke. Can we just admit that? Three out of 10 Christians come to church every month. The rest don't. They're Christians though. 30% of us read our Bible. 70% of us, we just never do. We don't have time. 16% of us go to home group. 18% of us serve. The rest of us just don't. 7% of us tithe and put God first in our finances. 93% of us, we just don't. We're in the middle. 5% of Christians in the American church share their faith. The other 90, 95% just, just don't. While we're in the middle, and the middle is making us miserable. 
In fact, I started thinking about that in my own life. I have boys that are similar age. And I can't imagine, like, usually when they, when they play, they get, they get into the same bracket in rec league soccer. And so, uh, because we can't play travel because it's on Sundays because it's a God. And so, uh, but I got a whole other thing. And so, and so we play rec league, right, which, which eats away at me. Because when you play rec league, you get, you get rec league kids and, so, and rec league parents. And it's just, it just sucks. And so... <laughs> You don't keep score. They need water breaks and then after 15 minutes because it's 90 degrees. I mean, come on. Remember when you were a kid, you're like, I want to play the whole game. Amen? Amen. I don't want to sit on the side. You get wrecked, league kids. are like, I need a water break, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. And so anyway, so, what was I t- so my kids get on the same team every couple years. They're in the same bracket because they're, they're only 20, 22 months apart. So I'll coach both of them, but I never put them on different teams. Because I don't want to be in the car on the way home when we play against each other. And one of them won, and I'm celebrating. The other one played awful. What's the conversation sound like? Dude, great job today. You were awful today. <laughs> if they both lose, we can, we can talk about it. We can, we can, we can pray about it. We can ye- sometimes yell about it. We can everybody lose. But some of you, you're in the middle, and you're winning at nothing. So I guess if there was a title for my sermon... Besides, besides Elijah, it would be make a wild commitment to God today. Go, go all in or go all out. It's the weirdest thing in scripture. Jesus will have all of you or none of you. He's the only person in our life that we, listen, that we think that's okay with, by the way. Could you imagine? I've done, I did a wedding this weekend for two really close friends. Could you imagine one of them being like, you know, with this ring? I promise you 45% of my life. It's good. We would stop the wedding, right? It's a hundred, you're going to give 100% of your life or nothing. But when it comes to Jesus, we're like, we'll give you Sunday. Friday is my night though. I was stressed out all week. I need Friday. He'll take all of you or none of you. So I want to show you kind of how this plays out and how to make this decision. I, I, I just entitled my, my, the, the title of my points, Making a Decisive Stand in Your Life. Make a decisive stand in, in, in your life. So number one is this. This one's important. Right now, wherever you're at, answer truthfully to yourself. Be, be truthful with yourself. And, and here's why I say this, because I feel like we're not that truthful with ourselves. I feel like we, we say stuff like we believe in sin. We believe Jesus was put on the cross because of the weight of our sin, right? To pay our sin. But many people still, still sin. Like we still have sex outside of marriage and we still get drunk and we still look at pornography and we, we're still et cetera, right? I can just keep going. Like we'll say stuff like, like I believe in Jesus and the message of the gospel and heaven and hell, but we don't live our life like hell is real at all. We don't, we don't talk to anybody about Jesus. We look at people and we just, we just kind of go. And, and I watch, I watch, a, I watch a, a, a pastor's son, a famous pastor. He grew up and now he's an atheist, right? And so I, I started watching him. I was like, I got to see what he says. And he gets on, on thing. He does little, little TikTok videos. And he said, he said I just want to tell you, Christians don't believe in hell. And he said, I'll prove it to you. So I listen. I'm like, let me, let me hear. This guy, his, his dad is a super smart pastor and, you know, very, very deep. And so he has a son who's an atheist. I'm like, let me hear what you say. He says, here's how I know Christians don't believe in hell. If you believed in hell, right, the reality of hell, when you went out to eat and you ordered a meal and you looked at the people around the restaurant and realized a lot of them don't know Jesus and they're going to hell, you wouldn't be able to eat anymore. You'd be sick to your stomach. You wouldn't be whining about how your steak was medium well instead of medium rare. You'd be worried that the person that was serving you didn't know Christ. You you would change how you ate with people. It would change your family dynamics. It would change in your workplace if you really believed in hell. And so I guess what I'm trying to tell you is at some point, be truthful with yourself. Is what you believe real or isn't it? Is heaven and hell on the line or isn't it? And this is what Elijah does if you go back into the story. He says, gather all the, the prophets of Baal. There's 450 prophets of Baal. There's one prophet for God. All the people gather around. Pressure, it bursts pipes or makes diamonds. We're going to build two altars on the God, the Mount Carmel, the the mountain of God. And you guys are going to build an altar, and I'm going to build an altar, and there's going to be two bulls. 
You can pick whatever bull looks more flammable. You're going to put the bull on, on, on the altar and cut it up into pieces. And you're going to pray, and then I'm going to pray. And whichever one of us prays to the right God and he sets it on fire, then we know what is truth. In other words, what Elijah's doing is he's saying, this is what you believe, then prove it. If this is what you believe, then, then prove it. And I, and I just, I want, like, I want you to think about your life. If you really believe it, then believe it. But if you're walking through this earth and you're going, I don't really believe it, then find a better truth to follow. If you really believe that success comes from gathering stuff and uh, acquiring accomplishments and, and going on vacations, then go all out. Stop giving a couple dollars to the church. If you really believe that the best thing you can do is invest in yourself, in yourself, in yourself, why you come here twice a month? Don't waste a dime of your, your, your time because you can never get it back. Listen, if, listen, if you really believe that the best you can do is in your physical body, listen, don't tuck it, tan it, tone it, tattoo it, like go after it, right? Take pictures of it, flaunt it, thirst trap it, whatever you got to do, right? But go all out, whatever is going to be truth in your life, build your life on it. This is what he says. We're going to stand on our truth in this moment. So I guess I would just say, man, just be truthful with yourself. Which is really hard. If you take a leadership test, most people fail on the ability to see themselves in the right light. Like, I know because I don't. I'll take a test. I'll be like, that's wrong. I'll ask Leah. I'll be like, you're wrong. <laughs> Ask your staff, you're wrong too. Everybody's wrong. I know because I have a good heart. <laughs> right? Just be truthful with yourself. Let me just give you another thought. Number, number two is this. This is, this is where it gets, it gets good. Number two, after you're truthful, commit totally to whatever your truth is. Commit totally to whatever your truth is. You see, it's hard for us to commit totally to anything, isn't it? We've developed this thing in America called cheat day. You know what I'm talking about? You go on a diet, you're like, it's, it's cheat day. What the heck is that? <laughs> cheat day turns into cheat week. Cheat week turns into cheat pandemic body, right? <laughs> you, you know that's true because one of the national news stories that came across my feed, of, uh, my feed a few weeks ago was Will Smith's dad bod from the pandemic, <laughs> right? And he was definitely getting jiggly with it, if you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> And you're like, well, how did that happen? Well, because he was, I met Will Smith, man. He was in I Am Legend. He was jacked, right? And so, and, and, and so he went from cheat day to cheat meal to cheat, me, cheat meal to cheat day, cheat day to cheat week, cheat week, cheat month, cheat pandemic body. And this is how we do. Like, I'm going to serve the Lord, but I also have a cheat day. I'm going to do, do me this day. I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give myself a little bit. I'm going to have a cheat day. I'm going to go out here and I'm going to have a little bit to drink. And I'm going to have a cheat day and I'm going to have a little bit of premarital or outside. You know what I'm talking about. I don't know who's in here today. Sometimes I'm like, I got I to watch what I say. You, you, can, you, you, you can have a little bit of a cheat day, right? And I'm just going to tell you that the way to follow the Lord is to commit totally to him. If you're not, commit totally to whatever your truth is going to be. So I love this part, First Kings 18. You got to feel this moment. He lets them go first. Confidence always lets somebody go first. And they begin to do their thing, the Bible says. So they prepared one of the bulls and placed it at the altar. They called in the name of Baal from morning until noontime. That's a long church service. They shouted, oh, Baal, answer us. But there was not a reply of any kind. Then they danced and they hobbled on the altar that they made. About noontime, Elijah comes onto the scene. I love this part. Sometimes people are like, you know, because I, I like to talk when I do anything. You know, you shouldn't talk trash. I'm like, Elijah did. <laughs> right? Elijah did. It's biblical. It's in the Bible. <laughs> Elijah shows up and this. Watch what he says. I love this. This is Bible. It's so good. He says, he says, shout louder for surely he is God. And then he says, nah, maybe he's daydreaming or relieving himself. Bible, y'all. <laughs> this is He's a, like sometimes people are like, you said, you said crap in your sermon. You need to grow up. I'm like, no, no. Elijah says it, right? 
Maybe he's out relieving himself. Maybe he has IBS, he says. Or maybe he is away on a trip or a sleep or he needs to be awakened. So what they do? So they shout a louder and they follow their normal custom. They cut themselves with knives and swords until blood gushed out. And they raved all afternoon. But there's no sound, no reply, no response. I love that. You know what, though? At least they raged. At least they went all after it. See, I, people ha- will talk about religion sometimes, and I'll, I'll tell people this. This will shock them, but I'll say, I respect Muslims in our world and their commitment to their faith, even though I think it's garbage, much more than I respect most apathetic American Christians. Because they're willing to sacrifice their entire life, and we can't even sacrifice an hour on Sundays. See, whatever, whatever you're going to believe, go all after it. Co- coolest part happens next, and it's Elijah's like, it's my turn. You get to see him. Because he knows what's about to happen. God's been feeding him for three years. God's been preparing him. He builds the altar, the Bible says, of God. He cuts up the second-rate bull because they got the best one. Takes out a shovel, digs a trench around the altar, takes water. By the way, what is the most important commodity in that country at this point? It's water. This is downright cocky. (laughs) There's not an ounce because he is ticked off and he is tired of watching God's people suffer. He takes the water and he dumps a couple gallons of water all over the bull. He steps back. You can read it in scripture. He begins to pray, God, you've never let me down. God, you're the one true living God. God, make it happen. No wailing, no, no, no effort, no cutting himself. God, I know you can do it. And the Bible says in the next moment, fire comes down from heaven. And what a moment. Committed totally to him. There's a lady that, that my wife has read a bunch that uh, she's read me stuff from her. Her name's Kay Arthur. She's an she's a old, older woman, a saint of, of, the, of the church. And she wrote this. She said, She said, if you don't plan to live your Christian life totally committed to knowing your God and to walking in obedience to him, then don't even start it. For this is what Christianity is all about. It's a change of citizenship, governments, allegiance. If you have no intention of letting Christ rule your life, then forget Christianity. It's not for you. It's not for you. Find something else that you can give your life to. Commit, Commit totally or quit. Figure out your truth and build your life on it. Let me just give you one more. This one's important. Number three, kill brutally. Kill, kill brutally. And we get this in, at marriage. In marriage, you, you, you have relationships, and no, most of us don't come to the, to the altar and never have any past relationships. It's just not the way it works. Every once in a while, you meet somebody, they're like, we dated since we were three. <laughs> Great, right? But most of us have been in some serious relationships and been brokenhearted and uh, giving ourselves away to some people and they still have that emotional baggage that we're attached to. But when we get married, what do we do? We cut, we cut them out, the old people, and we give ourselves fully to the new person. You don't keep the numbers. You don't keep the friend requests. You don't speak to them online when nobody's looking. You don't daydream and wonder what they're doing. You cut them out of your life. That's what you do. It makes sense. To be successful, you get rid of them. And so what's so interesting is Elijah doesn't stop there. He goes all the way for the jugular. The Bible says in verse number 40, then Elijah commanded, seize all the prophets of Baal, all 450 of them. Not, not, listen, all of them, 450. Get all the prophets of Baal, the Bible says. Don't let a single one escape. Why? Because they were leading the people's hearts away from God. And he says, let's go. I'm taking you out to the valley of Kishon. And the Bible says he kills every one of them. He kills every one of those false prophets. And some of you say, why did he do that? Well, the principle in scripture is you are killing or you're being killed. You're either, you're either killing stuff off in your life through the Holy Spirit or you're allowing the devil to gain a foothold in your life. And I've seen it too many times. One foothold leads to another foothold, leads to a stronghold, leads to somebody walking away from their faith. You're either fighting or, or oftentimes you're wandering away. And, and I just want to ask you, or some of you, as I've talked, you know what you're holding back. There's a relationship that you're in that you, you shouldn't be in because you're not married and you're, you're sleeping with them and 
you know the Bible says you're going to follow me that you can't be sleeping with them unless you want to get married and you don't want to marry them you would have because you've been dating them 16 years and you just got to kill it off it's like, that's, that's a lot of history yeah but your history is keeping you from your future or call me I'll get you married tomorrow I got that power I don't have a lot of power but I got the power some of you live with somebody right now right now you live with somebody and you've been coming to this church for a long time and I'm glad you're here and you began a relationship with God and you're still living with them and you're still sleeping with them and you've been making excuses and you say stuff like you don't have money you don't have time we got time tomorrow I'll marry you tomorrow we'll make it happen like, like there's things that you can do where you commit totally some of you some, some of you it's getting rid of phone numbers you shouldn't have in your phone or a black book if you're that old right it's literally, it's literally, you are killing something or you are being killed. The Bible says the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking to devour. He doesn't come, ah. That's not how lions work. They're not fast enough. They sneak around and they get close and they get close and they get close and you invite them in by, bite them in by not watching and eventually he pounces and destroys. And some of you continue to invite him into your life without even being aware of it and you need to kill something off in your life commit totally listen listen to me commit totally to this or figure out something else to commit totally to because the middle will destroy you it'll destroy some of you hiding right now you're ashamed you're constantly worried you're constantly struggling with something you're carrying around because nobody else knows about it but you and you fake it when you come to church and man, i've been in church my entire life I, I know that i know in a room like this there is somebody here that you are you are literally in prison to lust and pornography and nobody else knows about it and you think you're good because you're here today and you've got the mask on. you got the mask on. You know what I'm talking about, the church mask? And you're fine, but it is killing you inside. So you can kill it or you can continue to be killed. You commit fully to this or you fully walk away. That's the only way to do it, friend. The middle is miserable. Would you stand with me to your feet all over our houses? And would you do me a favor? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? See, a lot of you still have some stuff laying around in your life that needs to go. A lot of you still have numbers in your phone that need to get erased. A lot of you keep going back to habits that you shouldn't go back to. Habits you even started during the pandemic because you were afraid, but that fear is fading. Some of you skipping weeks of tithing, skipping church for reasons that are suspect. And I'm just telling you, you're giving your life over to Satan for him to sift and conquer and overcome. And I, I only, I'm sorry if you're here, but I only know one way to follow Christ. You give him everything that you have. You'll notice, you'll notice that I didn't say he's calling you to perfection. You'll notice that. But he's calling you to make a decisive decision. I'm going to kill in my life what needs to be killed. I'm going to commit fully to him. And if I can't, maybe I need to be truthful with myself. Maybe this isn't for me. And that, I, I release you. I respect that. In fact, it's happened. Every head bowed and every eye closed. It happened a few years ago. Somebody called me from this church, very, very, very involved in this church. And he knew where we stood on the biblical principles of marriage and gender. And um, doesn't mean we don't love people, but we love truth more. And so we shared truth and very involved. I had meals with him. I've watched him grow. And he just sent us an email and he said, he said, I've been living a double life. I don't want to do it anymore, but I'm choosing to follow that life and not Jesus. And it broke my heart, but I respected him for making the decision. So maybe some of you, that's, that's like, this, this is the weirdest altar call ever. You're asking me to leave the faith? No, I'm asking you to stop being tortured. It's an awful place to be. Give everything to God or give everything to whatever you want to give it to. But here's the thing about it, because you're not going to get to heaven someday and God's going to go, you know what? Thank you for that relationship that I have with you on Sundays. He's not just your savior. The Bible says he wants to be your Lord and not only wants to be, he needs to be your Lord and your savior. So some of you in this place, that's just not you today. You're just not, not there, but you're ready to be there. Like you're, you're ready to make that decision. You're ready to commit fully to him to let go of your old life 
what you're going through, what you've been through, what you, what you, what you participate in, and you are ready to fully give your life to Jesus Christ. And if you are, I'm going to ask you in a second, man, I'm speaking to you, I'm talking to you, and you're saying, man, that's me. Maybe you've been feeling this, this, word about the, this word in the Bible called conviction. Conviction is simply the voice of the Holy Spirit saying there's something better for you. That's not God being angry with you. That's not, a, that's not a, a voice that wants to shame you. That's the voice of the Spirit saying there's something better for you. But everything great in your life hinges on the yes to God in this moment. Listen to God. Do what he says. Listen to God. Do what he says. Some of you in this place, you have hidden for so long. Now you almost feel successful, but it is torturing your soul. The Bible says, come to me if you're weary, heavy laden, and I'm going to give you rest. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. You're burdened right now by your sin. You can come to Jesus. His burden is light. Come on, I want him to be the Lord of my life, not just my Savior. We stop there in America so much. I, I'm, I'm saved by God. I went to confirmation class. My parents got, got put me through those classes when I was a kid. So I'm saved by Jesus. When I get to heaven someday, I'll be there because I said a prayer and I went through a class. No, no, he's your, is he your Lord? Is he in control of your life? He'll take all or he'll take none of you. There's no other way around it. I'm going to give everything that I have to Jesus Christ. So come on, if that's you, you've been holding back. But today you're going to let go. You want to say yes to Jesus Christ. I want to pray with you as we close. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Some of you, just to be frank, you can make this decision, but the truth is you're going to make a decision, but it's going to lead to a domino effect of another decision because this decision is going to call you to step into truth and, 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 uh, and make that decision that you know you should have been making. And so it's, it's not going to stop here. This is just the beginning. This is just the beginning. Some of you in this place need a relationship with Jesus. You're in Montgomeryville. You need a relationship with Jesus. You need to commit your entire life to him. You're watching online. You need to commit your entire life to him. I want him to be the Lord of my life. Come on up. That's you all over this house. I want you to do something for me as I'm talking to you with courage, with conviction, with hope, with an understanding this moment is, is monumental. But if that's you, would you just begin to slip your hand straight towards heaven and say, man, you've been, you've been speaking to me today. I want to make Jesus the Lord of my life right now. I'm going to commit my life fully. There's some hands over here. Yeah. Hands over here. Yeah. Anybody else? Hand, hand. Yeah. Yeah. We'll give you a second in Montgomeryville. Say, I'm going to make Jesus the Lord of my life right now. I'm going to give him control. I'm going to commit fully. Some of you are like, I don't even know what that means. Listen, sometimes it's just a yes that begins the, the journey, the process. You don't have to un understand everything. You don't have to at all have it all figured out. You simply need to be available in this moment and say yes. So come on, is there anybody else who would say, hey, you're, you're talking to me. I missed that first one. But man, I need to give my life to Jesus Christ right now. I need to give my life to Jesus Christ. If you're online in the chat, maybe just type, that's me, so that we know we're praying with you. Let's begin to pray, Lord, church, all over this house. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for all that you've done. Lord, I thank you sometimes that the, that the, that the, the messages that feel the hardest are actually the ones that free us the most. Lord, you love us and you want a relationship with us. And Lord, we're sorry so many times knowing what you did for us, for the extent that you would go for us through that cross, the, 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 the pain you went through. Lord, so many times knowing all that, we still walk away and we want to hold back from you. And Lord, that's not who we are. Lord, we are full sin believers. Lord, we're going to give you everything that we have. You can have control of every aspect of our lives, Lord. We want to follow you with all of our hearts, Lord. And we know when we follow you that you guide us, that you direct us, that that brings freedom and hope and life and life to the fullest. And so we're grateful for that. We're grateful, Jesus, that you're setting people free right now. They're inviting you into their life, and you're setting them free through the power of the cross and the resurrection. Well, thank you for all that you've done here. Thank you, Lord, how you're going to move over the next few, few months, Lord. People are going to take hard next steps. Lord, we're going to take big faith-filled steps in our lives. We're going, to, we're going to live to our fullest for you, Lord. We're thankful for that. In Jesus' name we pray. One more time, Journey Church, let's shout amen together. Let's clap together all over our houses. Thank you so much for joining us online. If you're new to watching with us, we want you to know you're the reason we stream today's services. We have teammates ready to reach out to you, so please take a second to fill out the online info card. We would love to get you connected to what's happening here at Journey Church and answer any questions you might have. And if you live near us, we would love to meet you in person. Please visit our website at jrny.com.
www.thebridgeofhope.church for more information about a visit. And if you don't live near us, that's okay. We would love to get you connected to a church in your area. Make sure you keep up with us by downloading the Journey Church app. Here you can view past message notes, keep up with Journey Kids, and find out what's next in your relationship with Jesus. Make sure you share this link with a friend and invite them to join you next Sunday. We look forward to seeing you then. Thank you.